Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Lisa Butterworth wrote a post titled, Feminism, the F Word. We'll talk about that in our next conversation with Nancy Ross and Sarah Hanks, and we'll talk about feminism. Is it a road to apostasy? We'll also talk about the Community of Christ's ordination of women in 1984. It basically caused a schism in their church. Would the same thing happen in the LDS Church? Check out our conversation. I'd also like to remind you to please support Gospel Tangents. We could really use the support. Go to gospeltangents.com and click, click on the yellow subscribe button. Or subscribe at patreon.com slash gospeltangents. Just for 5 or $10 a month, you can help keep this podcast alive and help support us here at Gospel Tangents. We'd really appreciate your support. Now back to our conversation. So let me ask you a question, um, both of you, uh, you can, whoever wants to jump in is fine. So I'm trying to figure out my audience. I think most of my, my audience is still active LDS, although I know I, I have some, some non-LDS people, either former Mormons or even never Mormons. Um, but I know that for those who are active, um, I remember what, in fact, I was, it was in the first chapter, one of the, one of, one of my favorite uh, essays was, I think, Lisa's, mm -hmm. where she talked about the F word, feminism. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and so I know that there, were, there are going to be some people um, that are going to say, well, look, you know, she's left the church. She's not going to church anymore. Feminism is awful. It's an F word. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's really so, dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any ways to assuage that fear for people who, mm. who, who are active LDS that are like, I don't know if I should listen to these two people. They're, you know, yeah. one's out of the church and one's right. barely hanging on. Right. You know, so one thing I've done is I've surveyed Mormon feminists. And when I surveyed Mormon feminists, when we were experiencing that great big bubble of hope mm -hmm. during, during 2012 that 2012 to 2014, yeah, that great big bubble of hope, I, I, I surveyed Mormon feminists in 2013 and um, about 1,800 Mormon feminists. And I think it was 70-something percent of that group was active. Like, and most Mormon feminists at that time were active. Yeah. And it, it was a very exciting time to be active, you know. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and they were active, and, they, and overwhelmingly, you know, not only were they active, but they had some kind of calling, you know, and, and, and many of them had temple recommends. And at that time, most, most people were saying that their participation in Mormon feminism was helping them to stay in the church. Mm -hmm. And it, because it was helping them to negotiate and navigate those difficult points and to give them resources and community and support where maybe they would have just left if they hadn't had community and resources and support to stay in the church. Mm -hmm. And then at other times, you know, Mormon feminists, an example of people leaving has helped people leave. Mormon feminism both helps people to stay in the church if that is what their goal is, and it helps people to leave if that is what their goal is. Right. And I think that the community... Well, let me stop you for a second. Yeah. Was that your goal? To leave? <laughs> no. But, uh, uh, I mean... The reason I'm asking yeah, that sure. is because there are going to be people who say, well, if I, if I support it, then I'm, I, I've got one foot out the door. Right. Um, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> um, I'm trying to gather my thoughts and figure out the right starting point here. The whole idea of Mormon feminism helping people to stay or to leave, um, I, I relate to that and I resonate with that. I think it didn't so much, well, from, from personal experience, I'll say this. My faith crisis or my big turning point was when I went to the temple when I was 21 and I was about to get married and I went and received my endowments the week before my wedding. I had no idea, but walking to the temple, I felt completely clear and completely 100% all in with the church and leaving the temple I felt like everything had changed and I didn't know who God was anymore and like mm -hmm. and that was very uncomfortable and what I needed at that point what I wanted more than anything was to see examples of people who had a difficult time with the church for any whatever reason mm -hmm. and still stayed because mm -hmm. I wanted to stay more than anything but I didn't know you know looking at my family and my wards it seemed like everybody was just really comfortable and and so I thought well how do I stay if I'm not comfortable and if I have questions, right? And so Mormon feminism, the people I met, the stories I read, really did help me to stay for 10 years. 
Um, and because of all these external um, events, excommunication, exclusion policy, um, Mormon Me Too and sexual abuse and stuff, I think I have also seen examples that convinced me that, it, that there was also a way to leave in a healthy mm -hmm. way. Not that that was what I wanted to do, but when I felt, when I felt that spiritual prompting that that's, that that's what my next step was, I felt like, okay, I have seen from these people's examples that I can do that and I can still be a spiritual person. I can still have a strong relationship with God. I can still care. I can still be loving, you know? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's not so much about like helping you do whatever you want to do, but showing you that there are different options and, and giving you the empowerment to say, okay, since I know all these options are available to me, which one feels right? Which one do I really want? Do I want to stay and have maybe like an uncomfortable activity level or whatever? Do I want to do that? Do I want to leave? You know, whatever it is, you kind of see that, that, there, that there are possibilities that, that you can figure out which one you want. And, and I would even say to that, that question of like, oh, well, Mormon feminism makes women leave or, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that assumption really decenters the idea that there are problems in the LDS church mm -hmm. and there are problems with the LDS, the way in which the LDS community treats women and LGBT people and people of color and mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the problem. And the Mormon feminism was to try and help make that easier. And so the problem isn't with the feminism. The problem is structural in the LDS church. And if, and if you don't belong to a group that can be sometimes seen as an outcast, or maybe if you, if, if you are a woman, you're totally happy, and the church is working for you, that's great. But, but there needs to be more space. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that excluding women in particular ways, um, excluding LGBT people in particular ways, that creates very real, very real difficulties. In, for those people and their families in the church. And so that their church activity is not a happy, life-giving thing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what needs addressing. Yeah. Right, right, like, like that, that, that's what needs addressing. Right. That, like, that's, that's where the problems and the structural issues lie. Not mm -hmm. seeking not help. Not in the response, but right. in the actual. So, yeah. um, so another question I had was, uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about your survey. We, Kind of so you said you did that survey back in, I want to say, 2013. 2013. And 70% were active. 70-ish percent were active, okay. yeah. And so, because um, I believe at Mormon History Association, you gave another follow-up to that. Can you talk about the, yeah. what has changed since 2013? Yeah, so I did a follow-up survey in 2015 with Jessica Finnegan, my writing and academic research partner. And we, and, and, and that activity rate was much lower. This was after John DeLynn's excommunication, but before the exclusion policy, so early 2015. Mm -hmm. And those activity rates were not the same. You know, they were, they were much lower. Um, and that's what I expected to find. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's also fair to say that like, when the church excommunicates people publicly for doing things like asking church leaders to pray for about the potential of women's ordination and the church kind of slaps that down and says no you can't ask you can ask questions but you can't ask questions or you can't ask that question or a woman can't ask that question or however you want to frame it mm -hmm. it's it's like there's a lot of that people lose trust and, and, and in mormonism we often conflate trust and faith in god with faith in the LDS church and trust in the LDS church mm -hmm. as though those are absolutely the same thing and you can't actually peel them apart because they are one and the same. Mm -hmm. And Mormon feminism helped me to see that they were different things, that the LDS church was a man-made institution trying to respond to feelings about God's call and place in the world. But that didn't always line up with my own personal experiences of God. And it turns out that lots of women and other people feel the same way. And that maybe I also learned that the LDS church didn't have a monopoly on God. And there were other ways to access God. Yeah. So 
sorry, I, I forget where the question is. <laughs> so yeah. the, so the so survey. Yeah. The survey, yes, this. sorry. So because one of the things you said was so there was a pretty pretty steep decline in activity. Yeah. Right? Yes. It went from That's 70% right. to 50%, is that what you said? Uh, probably something like that. I don't have all the numbers okay. in, my, in my mind. So I think I might have asked you this, but it wasn't on camera. Sure. <laughs> have you seen, do you think that LDS church leaders have noticed that, that it is causing concern that at least the females are losing some activity. You know, or is it so small that it doesn't? It's a it's a necessary thing. We have to get rid of these. I can't really speak for them. Yeah, I don't. I don't really know what happens in the church office building, and I can you know speculate, but I'm not sure that that speaks to any of the realities. Well, I, the, the reason why I ask is. Um, I just I remember you know in June we had the mm -hmm. 40th anniversary of the yes. Revelation on Christ's mm -hmm. Wild Blacks to, to join the church and I was actually a bit surprised I want to say it was in the Dead Sea News um, that said that uh, I, was, I was quite surprised actually that um, some people had been upset uh, with the 1978 revelation yes. and while the numbers were small. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these people that were upset by a person from this revelation actually joined some of the fundamentalists. Right. Yes. And right. so, wow. In the LDS church, it was, a, it was a very small number. For the fundamentalists, it was a big it was number. It yeah. yeah. really helped grow their numbers. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, I'm wondering uh, last year when I attended Sunstone, mm -hmm. I talked with John Hamer and Mark mm -hmm. McKay, mm -hmm. uh, the Sunday following Sunstone, mm -hmm. and uh, in talking there, uh, Locke, Locke actually gave the, the Sunday School lesson. Have you ever yes. heard Locke speak? Yes. He's awesome. That was one of the best Sunday School lessons <laughs> ever. Um, he, he was fantastic. And he talked about that in the previous interview. But um, one of the things that the people in that congregation in Salt Lake City mm -hmm. said that following, and it seems like the November exclusion policy yeah. was kind of, you know, it might have been Kate Kelly that got the ball rolling, but that, that was like mm -hmm. the final straw for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. And I know that that congregation in Salt Lake City exploded. Not Interesting. Well, they went from just a few, maybe a dozen or two, to over a hundred wow. um, of, of LDS people that joined with the community class, kind of like right. we did. Right. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, does, do the numbers have to be bigger before the LDS church says, oh, maybe we made a mistake? Or, mm. or is, it, is it more like with the polygamists, it's just a small number for the for the community of Christ. It's great, or for the fundamentalists in 1978, it was great mm -hmm. because it expanded the numbers. But overall, it's just yeah. a small number, so it's 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 right. It's not worth it to I, change. I I think that. Sorry, do you, do you? Have... I mean, my guess, completely uninformed guess, as somebody who doesn't work for the church or anything. Um, my guess is that there's. There's not a lot of consideration of the possibility that they've made a mistake mm. on any on any front, and and um, I think the the men um, who run the church and the bureaucracy that supports them, by and large, really believes in their prophetic calling and the fact that they um, that God wouldn't let them do something wrong, you know wouldn't let them lead the church astray. So I don't, I, I could see people being disappointed or disheartened or whatever to see people leave, but there's always the explanation of, you know, having to, the, it being the, the last days and, and needing to sort of get rid of the, I, I don't, I forget Right, the, we're just kind of sinful apostates. Right, and, and yeah. kind of we need to, we need to kind of clear the field, you know, make sure that only the most dedicated um, are there. And so I, I, I would be very surprised if if there was like a concern over the number of people who've left following these so particular you things. you don't think LDS leaders are concerned about the people that are um, I mean, in, is, individually they may, right, I would say it depends on what you mean by concern. They're, they're, they might have a feeling of disappointment or regret might be too big of a word, but a feeling of like, oh, I wish that weren't the case, but concern that's actionable, I don't, I don't see it personally. But then again, I'm not in a position where I necessarily would see it. I've, you know, I've heard rumors about such things and such concerns, particularly mm -hmm. about in Southern Utah, about 
Community of Christ and um, the snuffer movement taking mm -hmm. people away right, um, right. from LDS Church. I think that the actual realistic numbers are very small, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I don't know if, if church leaders understand why people would yeah. change traditions very yeah. well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think that that is a really interesting research question. Um, Mm -hmm. Let me throw out another, another thing. So, I interviewed Michael Quinn mm -hmm. uh, at the Upper Ground of Monday, Texas. And um, one of the things that he said that really surprised me, um, for my listeners at home who may not be familiar with uh, Brother Quinn, uh, he had written a, uh, a chapter in Maxine Hanks' book. Mm -hmm. I am related to Maxine. Well, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, Maxine Hanks. Uh, I, I only met her a few years ago. Um, but yeah, we're. Distant cousins, you know. Oh, wow, that's cool. The way Mormons are with polygamy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, you know, we talked about the, the manifesto in 1890 uh -huh. about polygamy. Yeah. And, there, and there really was pretty much an almost a schism there. Yeah, yeah. So that's where the fundamental church started. Uh, with my interviews with, with Matt Harris, one of the big concerns with President Kimball mm -hmm. was to have another schism over blacks mm -hmm. and Christians. Right. Um, and so I asked Michael, uh, about ordained women. First of all, one of the things that you said that I thought was very interesting was women, women already have the priesthood. Yeah. They don't need, yeah. They and that's what he argues in yeah. Maxine's yeah. book. Right. And so, um, but, but he also said if we were to ordain women, um, he fears, you know, just like with the Community of Christ in 1984, mm -hmm. they really had a, a split over that issue. Mm -hmm. um, a, a really a schism. Uh, he's concerned that the LDS Church would have a similar schism. And I was a bit surprised because we went through 1978. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't call that a schism. There were, there were some there people. Were some, but yeah. I, how do you feel about that? I think there are a lot more women in the church than there were black people in the church in 1978. And everybody knows, every member of the church, every man in the church knows a woman and probably lives with a woman. Um, and not everybody in 1978 knew a black person or had a close relationship. And so I think the impact that it has on people's lives would be very different than that revelation was for the average, you know, white member of the church in 1978. You know, if, if they announced the ordination of women tomorrow, that would change everybody's family system in a really big way. And I think it probably, I mean, it was difficult for people to, except in 1978 and even hard, even those who did accept it, it was even harder to change their mindset to actually like deal with all the built up prejudices that they had received from the church. I mean, that's still, that's an ongoing process. And so I think it would be that, it would be exaggerated in, the, in that hypothetical situation because the impact would be larger. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Nancy Ross and Sarah Hanks. In our next conversation, we'll talk about the early practice of Mormon healing by laying on of hands by women. What if that was brought back into the LDS Church? Would that be welcomed? And it would be awesome if there was an acknowledgement that women could give blessings in the open. That mm -hmm. would be great. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make the church fully a safer place for women. That doesn't right. put women, more women on decision-making councils right. where women's needs and a diversity of women's needs are acknowledged and accounted for in a decision-making right. process. Right. I hope you enjoyed that short clip from our next interview. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please go to our patreon.com slash gospel tangents and subscribe for just $5 a month. If you'd like a transcript of this, please click the yellow subscribe button at gospeltangents.com and I'll send you this and all future transcripts. Also, if you'd like a paperback like we've got here, those are available at our website at amazon.com. Just do a search for Gospel Tangents. Please get all updates at our Facebook page at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. We're also on Twitter at gospeltangents. You can also get transcripts individually at our website, gospeltangents.com slash shop. Finally, make sure that you subscribe on our Apple podcast page. Just do a quick search for uh, Gospel Tangents there and give us a five-star review while you're at it. Thanks again for listening. Your support helps create more Mormon history classes and podcasts such as this. And so I really appreciate you listening. Please share with your friends. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our great videos. Thanks again.